Welcome to Eye Contact. Uh, I'm Satish Srinivasan. Today we are speaking to uh, Thomas Conan uh, about achieving optimal cataract and refractive outcomes with presbyopia and toric intraocular lenses technologies. Welcome, Dr. Conan. Uh, could you describe the concept of the new extended depth of focus intraocular lenses? Um, I think that the uh, extended depth of focus lenses can be divided in three, in four different categories. We talk about uh, diffractive, non-diffractive, coming up, then aperture-based and pinhole-based uh, EDOF lenses, so to say, extended depth of focus IOLs. Do you want to expand a little bit more on each of these categories for the audience? Yeah, well, at the moment, when, when we, have, we call brand names like uh, the, the Symphony and the Lara uh, from Zeiss and from Abbott, uh, basically these are diffractive lenses. Uh, then we have uh, the IC8, which is an aperture-based lens, uh, or pinhole-based lens, and then we have the Minivel from uh, the Italian companies who fall in the aperture-based uh, category. So basically, uh, they are working on a different principle, but they prolong the focus in the eye when the lens actually touches from the cornea through the lens, so the intraocular lens, and then onto the retina. And therefore, they're extending the depth of focus, and patients are benefiting uh, from this because then they have not only distance visual acuity, also other acuities, usually in the intermediate space, and they are not uh, so much for the total dis uh, the near visual correction. Sure. The, a lot of new technologies and new lenses which are coming into the market today, how do you summarize the current technologies from what we had maybe 10, 15 years ago? Well, I, I, I would, the major, for me, the major step in presbyopia correcting IOL was uh, from the bifocal lenses to the trifocal lenses. And the reason is very, very bluntly, very easily said, is that with the bifocal lenses, we had distance and near, which was already good, and compared to monofocal lenses, they had a lot of, uh, still a lot of visual symptoms. Um, then the trifocal lenses came on the market and they were actually filling the gap of the intermediate space. Patient didn't like not to be able to read at the computer. They had near visual acuity and for distance, but they don't, uh, could see well at the computer. And once the trifocal lenses came, then the patients were much happier with the outcome. Nevertheless, they still have, according to our studies and according to what we see in the clinic every day, still some optical phenomena, but per se, that is not really uh, um, preventable uh, in, in this type of multifocal lenses. So for me, the major step was bifocal lenses to trifocal, and then from the trifocal lens, when they were really working very well, parallel to this, the EDOF lenses developed, and the EDOF lenses actually now have filled another gap, because those patients who are uh, treated for really spectacle independence, which was with bifocal lens the same, now we're treating with trifocal lenses, but those patients who come from monofocal lenses and want to have more, with other words, more depths of focus, more vision than just to see at distance, we're now treating with EDOF lenses. And on some occasions, we also have EDOF lenses indication like special indications, post-refractive patients, dry eye symptoms, irregular cornea. So that's also a very in a good indication for these lenses. Nevertheless, you also can use them for presbyopia correcting, but you always need to understand that you don't have the full correction for near visual acuity. So the presbyopia correcting IOL have extended from bifocal to trifocal, and then from trifocal in the range of ADOF, and this has tremendously broadened our spectrum on presbyopia correcting intraocular lens solutions. Sure. At least in Europe now we have got, we are at in an advantageous position where we have got access to all these different technologies, which brings up to the next question of if somebody is beginning to offer these technologies to their patients, how do they go about broadly selecting what technologies to use for their patients? Well, you know, <coughs> you cannot say this in a couple of words. You know, of course, you have to go to, to, to good yeah. uh, symposia, to good sessions where you can learn about uh, all these things, because I think it's, it's a combination of, you have to understand the technology yourself in optics. You have to do a good, good pre-optive uh, counseling of the patient. This includes not only measurements, but also really talking to the needs of the patients. And then from there, it's 
provides or should go into the surgery, the surgery in, in these type of lenses have to be very good because you cannot allow yourself to have a lot of decented eye wells or not well fixated eye wells. That's, that's a really important step, so you have to work on your, on your technique of that. And then you can go in all the different uh, categories of lenses and most likely it would be very easy to start with EDOF lenses because they are more forgiving than trifocal lenses. And trifocal lenses have to be not only, uh, you know, that they're good centered, they have to be really on terms of refractively neutral, then you have a very good outcome. So that means you have to work on your biometry and that goes back to the beginning. You have to, good, you have to do good preoperative measurements and you have to learn all the tricks about that. For somebody who's beginning to start this procedure, apart from going to symposias and listening to lectures, would you be able to give any other advice on how they go about embarking on this um, process? Yeah, well, to all what I just mm. said is, you know, preoperative selection, then the technology you have to understand. I think one major point is you have to ad address astigmatism. This was, I can remember when we did multifocal lenses at the end of the you know, 90s, 2000 around, uh, we already knew if you have two diopters of astigmatism and you don't address this, then the multifocal lenses, the patients, even with glasses, they were not happy. So really, this is not a good combination. So the concept of understanding to correct astigmatism with toric lenses or with other technology is very important for all this. So you have to start really exploring on correcting the refractive error. With other words, it's refractive cataract surgery and you have to look at myopia, hyperopia, uh, astigmatism and then presbyopia. So the whole concept is good to understand. What are the most three most important things in your view if you're discussing presbyopia uh, corrections to patients who have got cost in their mind if they think their insurance plan may not cover but they're still inter interested in this technology uh, how do you speak to those group of patients? Well, uh, first of all, you know, we have a question, a very short question is, we ask patients, you know, are you, will, uh, are you interested in having no glasses after surgery? If they say, oh, I don't care, then I mean, you usually don't have to, you know, proceed. You still can give them the options, but I would ask that. So with, if they say yes, then I also ask them, do you drive a lot at night? If they drive a lot at night, then I have to be a little bit more careful about those who, you know, have a lot of driving activities at night in terms of trifocal lenses. So maybe I would go to the, in the future, to the non-diffractive uh, EDOF lenses for these patients. Um, and then do you have, I looked at the, at, at, the, at the glasses and you can see easily if a patient has two diopters of astigmatism, you have then to add toricity. So these are my main three points which I very easily uh, bring to the patient. And of course, I, the main trick is not three, but basically to give them information, the patient, I think it becomes very important. Because patients whom you basically just put a monofocal lens and don't tell them that there are other options, they will, or at least the chances that they complain later because you haven't told them. Even if it's on the, not in the cost plan, you will, I will talk about the advantages and then at the end of the day, we have the, 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 the co-payment system in Germany. Then if they still go back and they want a monofocal lens, I let them do it. But if they want the option of touristy correction or presbyopia correction, then I really give them the option and I explain him all the options and then I bring him into the picture and let him decide what he wants. That's true. That's a good point. I think uh, pre-op counseling and giving information to the patients is very critical, especially from both from the medical legal point of view as well as from the clinical standpoint of view. The other thing which I wanted to discuss with you are patients who are uh, surgeons who are beginning to embark on these procedures. They always have the fear that what happens if I don't, if I have an unhappy patient postoperatively. Uh, do you have any tips for them to see how to go about <coughs> or how to have a structured protocol or a template? Well, we had a, <coughs> a template, not in a protocol, but basically these are usually. Um, a couple of things which make patients unhappy. And number one is if you have a lot of residual refractive error, patients are not happy if they have to wear glasses. If you allow them, if you promise them to be spectacle independent, then a large, you know, an astigmatic correction of two diopters is not what they want. Said this, nevertheless, I always tell these patients in the beginning that we cannot guarantee 100% spectacle independence, even with a trifocal lens, so that at least they're ready for you know, taking this uh, small amount. If they are, um, the, the, the doctors who do this, then I would 
uh, really counsel and look for all types of complications like dry eye. Is the lens centered postoperatively? So I like to search for the cause why the patient is unhappy and usually you find it. And if everything is still then correct, so if you have a cause and you can correct it, so with other words you have to treat dry eyes, patient becomes happy or you have residual astigmatism, you have to rotate a lens, so you have ought to address all these issues. If then you have done all this and at three months you can maybe prolong a little bit, but at a certain point if the patient is still unhappy, then you have to also talk about explanting an eye well. Said this, with all the measurements and with all the pre-op examinations we have done this, we rarely do this. We don't do it actually. But you have to be prepared and it's, I think it's a good way to approach patients to tell them that there is still a chance of one or two percent that you maybe have to take the lens out. It should not happen if we do all these things, but at least if the patient has heard this before, then it's much easier for you to handle him later. And for managing these kind of residual postoperative refractive errors and the problems, do you think um, a cataract surgeon would be able to embark on all this or do you feel that the surgeon has to be refractive trained so that he has got all the tools which is necessary to deal with these problems? You can, you can opt today, for example, if you have a misaligned IOL, you, can, you have tools to measure it or to calculate it and you can re-rotate it. That's a cataract tool. You can do this. Um, you can use add-on technology if you have a refractive error, but I think that you also, in, in some patients, uh, we use refractive surgery, and then of course you have to be a refractive surgeon with an eczema laser or with a femtosecond laser technology in order to do this. And this is sometimes very helpful, useful, if they just have a small refractive error with uh, uh, toracity rotation, you cannot always address everything, but you have a residual refractive error, then it's either the, 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 the type of add-on technology, but sometimes the refractive errors are very small and then I rather go to PRK or surface PRK and do these treatments. And this is usually a very, it's, it's a complex situation because patients don't like to be retreated afterwards. But again, this also goes into the preoperative counseling of your patient. You have to tell them because then they're relaxed, more relaxed that they be because they would have most likely anticipated. And maybe one other trick is, if you go in this area, you have to start with those patients who are in the middle range of intraocular lens power calculation. So with other words, if you go directly in the high myopes and the high hyperopes, you, the chance that you don't fit into that in, in the new lens with a new calculation profile is higher than you just go with a, let's say, 15 to 25 diopter intraocular lens. So I would highly recommend to start in this area and then with, e with kind of easy lenses, which are good to implant, and good um, out or the outcomes are kind of predictable, which you will get. Thank you, Dr. Honan, for your time. Um, thanks for watching us, and for more educational videos, visit eurotimes.org. Thank you.